Good morning. My name is Jim Mason. I'm Vice President at Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And this morning, I'm very excited to be talking with Sarah Schutte, who um, I discovered about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. Um, she works for National Review Magazine, where she is the um, in charge of their podcasts, editor and producer of their podcasts, but she also writes articles. And I discovered her work um, when I came across an article called A Homeschooler Walks Into a Bar. And I was immediately, obviously, intrigued. And I'm going to ask Sarah if she actually wrote that title or if her editors wrote that title, because it, it definitely drew me in. So welcome, Sarah. Hello, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very interested in um, learning about this, uh, this article. But first, let me just say that uh, what I learned in the article is that Sarah uh, was homeschooled growing up. She's uh, got a big family and um, comes from Ohio. And the article was describing her first days um, in New York City. So how did, how did it happen that a Midwest homeschool girl like you uh, arrived at National Review headquarters in Manhattan. <laughs> you can go back to the beginning. <laughs> okay. Well, so how far are we going to go back here? Like, <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll leave that to you, and then uh, Ethan will will make us cut off if we go too long. <laughs> so I, yes, like you said, I'm the oldest of a of a large family. I um, I'm the oldest of seven. From originally from Ohio, I am a graduate of Hillsdale College in Michigan, and I studied music there originally. So when most people ask me, like, "Oh, you're you're in, in journalism. What did you study in college?" And I'm like, "Oh, I was an opera singer." <laughs> um, so that that always starts conversation, which I, I loved my time there. But I got into radio while I was there, and through John Miller, who's the head of the journalism department, and Scott Bertram, who runs the radio program, I heard about this job with National Review. And originally I said no, because they like I wasn't even interested in applying for it because they said, you have to live in New York. And I was like, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then, I don't know, a couple of days later, I have this really distinct memory of Scott coming up to me and saying, so like, what if you didn't have to move to New York for this job? And I was like, oh yeah, I, okay, I'll, I'll consider it. And, um, so I did. I had an interview with um, Charlie Cook, who is now my boss, and did a little audition for him uh, working on some editing. And a little bit later, I had the job. Um, so I, I started and I really enjoyed what I was doing. Um, but I worked from home. I lived, I moved back to Ohio um, after graduation. I was living with my parents and uh, saving money, paying off loans. And then about six months into the job, I my boss said, so there's this editing positioning position opening up. Would you be interested? Um, and I said, maybe. Because um, I at this point, I was editing on the side for them, okay. or editing articles on MRO, the side, like, as well as doing podcasts. And I said, I would be interested, um, but I wanted to keep doing podcasting. And he said, well, maybe. We'll think about it. Um, so I applied for this position. And through a long series of events and interviews, I, or one interview, I, they said, we will give you the edit, an editing position, associate editing position, and you can keep doing podcasts if you move to New York. And I said, why not? Let's try it. So then in, I, I was in December of 2018 and in January of 2019, I packed up and moved to the city where I didn't know anyone. I, I didn't know anyone. Well, what was that experience like for you, um, Midwest homeschool um, young woman, Hillsdale College graduate, suddenly thrust into downtown Manhattan and surrounded by um, intellectual uh, world as well as a brand new megalopolis? It was overwhelming to say the least. I was pretty shell-shocked for a while. Um, I, play, I I'm a, a hyper planner. I have to figure out everything. So I'm like, well, I don't want to make any mistakes or get taken advantage of. So I have to figure everything out. But there's some things that you just can't prepare for. So <laughs> it was loud. It was exciting. It was all very new. Um, and then so that was the world of Manhattan. And then going walking into the office every day. Oh, my gosh, like, I, 
to be honest, I really had had no idea what, I didn't really understand the National Review until I got to the office. And then I just really started to understand the history and the culture and the importance. And I, I was just really blown away and, and excited. It, it got me even more excited that I was working there. It was such an honor to be working there. What, what was the, uh, the most difficult part and the most fun part of uh, moving to Manhattan? <laughs> oh man, so the most difficult part was the noise and it, I thought that the city was just really dirty and, and dark. It, I just really struggled with that. I really, it was far away from my family. We're very close and it was a struggle to live so far away from them. But, oh my gosh, the, I got to, like on the, on the good side of things, being in the NR office was amazing. And um, I got to go, to my, I saw my favorite opera singer. I saw Corbin Blue on Broadway. I um, got to sing at St. Patrick's Cathedral every week because um, I cantered for them. I, oh my gosh, I had the best cheesecake ever. And yeah. the people that I met, the people that I met there really made it. Um, just the people that I met within my sphere of coworkers and some other people that I met um, through different events that I did really helped me. They encouraged me um, in like, my professional life and in my spiritual life. Um, yeah, it was it was neat. So, well, how did how did being homeschooled as you were growing up um, in a large family in the Midwest prepare you for this life experience? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. I try to ask only really good questions. So as a professional podcaster, I really take that as a compliment that you, you, you call that out as a really good question. <laughs> well, mostly that's just my stalling tactic as I try to figure out how I'm going to answer the question. <laughs> so how would I say this? Hmm, there's not a lot that prepares you in the Midwest to take on the, the big city in a sense, but um, I think the, the little things that we did as a family every day prepared me to um, take on new experiences, no matter what they were. Um, and I tend to be a pretty even keel person anyway, so I just kind of take events as they come. Um, but our family was really good with having schedules. We had to get up in the morning. We, had, As a family, we prayed together. We went to church together every day. We were good about our family devotion time, things like that. So making sure that I was continuing my my routines and, and things, as well as experiencing and enjoying the things that New York had to offer, trying to make sure that I was sticking with my routines um, really helped me as I kind of transitioned into this a bit of a crazy time. So I didn't lose, I had that grounding, so I didn't kind of go off the deep end when I moved out there. Well, what was your homeschooling like when you were growing up? Um... And, and um, just talk to us about some of the joys and some of the challenges that you experienced growing up. So I just, um, I loved the fact that, so I was homeschooled um, preschool through 12th grade, all the way through. And um, I loved the fact that we really uh, learned how to learn. Um, we were encouraged in our love of reading and being outside, but also our curriculum was rigorous and particular. I mean, I was the guinea pig. I was the oldest, but, and, and the stuff that my siblings, I look at what my siblings are doing now and we do a really rigorous education and great books kind of education. So we're doing a lot of ancient and Roman history, which we loved. Oh my gosh. One of my, my favorite uh, history years that we did was history of the horse. <laughs> that was the coolest year. Um, we got to read all the Marguerite Henry books and we learned how to draw horses and we learned all about horses, but we were learning about history through these different uh, types of horses and these stories. It was one of my favorite years and I'm not a big animal person, so that says a lot. Um, so just the, I loved the flexibility that it gave um, my mom who to homeschool us in different ways, um, depending on uh, so some some of my siblings work better with facts and math. Some of us use teaching textbooks for a little while. Others of us um, needed a different writing program or something like that. So it could, she could tailor it to each one of us, but also it was challenging, and we had we had work to do. Um, but some of the <clears throat> excuse me challenges um, for me in particular is I have a learning disability, and it was not diagnosed until I was a uh, senior in high school. 
and that definitely played a role in some of my struggles um, through high school. Can you uh, talk to us about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have a nonverbal learning disability. And uh, if, if anybody's watching goes and looks this up, you'd be like, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, because I actually don't have a lot of the classic symptoms for a nonverbal learning disability. Um, but basically what it is, is I really struggle to sequence things. So math, grammar, which is funny because I'm an editor now, I really struggle with those things. Math, oh my gosh, hmm. just tears every day. It was really rough. Um, and so we kind of describe it as everybody's got shelves in their brains and you, you organize all of your material on your on your shelves, all your information. When I try to do that all in my head, when I try to do everything in my head, my shelves collapse. I can't, I cannot sequence things. I can't organize things. So once we learned this, I realized that I just had to be really external with everything that I did. I had to write things down. I had to work smarter, not necessarily, like I still had to work hard, but I had to work smarter, not necessarily harder sometimes because, so my sister, my, who's right under me, is really smart. She's super cool. And she, she and I could work on the same thing and I could work twice as hard at it as she does and still never be better at it than her. And that's just something I had to come to accept and figure out, well, in what ways can I do the best that I can do? I think I've lost your audio. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Aha, there we go. So one of the things um, that I learned, I have seven children as well, and one of our children had a learning disability that we discovered um, when he was in middle school and one of the things that, uh, that we really valued about being able to homeschool our children is that um, we, could, we could tailor the education to all of our kids, but um, also that there was you know, no kind of uh, stigma attached to different styles of learning, different challenges with learning, different uh, approaches that each of the children needed to succeed. Sounds like your family is very similar. Is that am I am I reading you right? Yeah, that is true. And it's just funny. My my sister and I were just having this conversation last night. Our parents, um, like there are certain things that, of course, all of us are expected to do. There are certain basic things that we are all treated the same way on, um, and they love us all, of course. But each one of us is kind of parented a little bit differently. Some of us need a little bit of a heavier hand. Some of us need more encouragement in, in certain areas. But for me, particularly with this learning disability, I think um, it's, you know, I needed a lot of encouragement, but also they took a firm line with me. They're like, no, you can, you can be better. You can do better. Mediocrity is not an option. And so I didn't want to take the standard. So with college, I didn't want to take the standardized tests. So I said, I'm going to go to community college. And there's nothing wrong with community college. My parents were like, no, that's great. If you want to go to community college, do it. You have to take the tests, though. And they they mm -hmm. stuck with that line. And as our, our we had an old neighbor who his line was always liking it is optional. Doing it is not. And they quote that to us all the time. And they really stuck that line with me. And that's really where I, why I am where I am today. So uh, one of the things that I also really value about my own family's homeschooling experience is kind of apart from education. And it's really that um, now all my kids are adults. My, my youngest is just finishing high school. She just turned 18. Um, but all of my kids are like best friends with all of the other kids. It's kind of an amazing thing to me. I mean, they don't, I'm not saying they're perfect and they don't have their squabbles and whatnot, but um, just the, the level of family closeness. I cannot imagine how my family could have achieved that if we had not chosen to homeschool. Um, and, and there's so many some similarities between our families with seven kids. Was your house as chaotic as ours? Uh, uh, and how did you manage to grow up still liking each other? It's <laughs> a very good question. Because of my parents, um, we we are still like we are friends. It, my parents are always like these. Yes, of course you should have friends outside the home. That's really healthy. That's really good. But your siblings are the ones that are going to be there for you for the rest of your life. 
and that's they always drove that home there was no mocking other siblings in my house of course we had fights and disagreements and and battles with each other there's si certain siblings that don't get along with each other very well but we were never allowed to mock each other or deride each other there were there were serious consequences for those kinds of things so they really but they not only did they how to take a, a firm line with those things. They also encouraged, um, we have really rousing discussions. We're always talking, we talk a lot in our house. Sometimes the guys actually talk more than the girls, <laughs> which is really funny, but we talk so much in our house. There was always discussion and always um, really good conversation at the dinner table and about what we're learning or about what we're reading. And the older kids, my mom has us help with the younger kids now. It's not. She knows that that's not our primary job, so that there's a balance there as well. But that being able to, and the younger kids look up to the older kids. Like it's like that old one room schoolhouse kind of idea where the little kids sit and listen as the older kids are are doing their work, and the, and the little kids are like, oh yes, I know the capitals and all of the states, and I know all these things that they haven't technically learned yet. Similar to that in that kind of way. But there was certainly a lot of chaos in our house. I mean, currently there are four kids at home still, but there are also two dogs, two budgies, a cat, <laughs> my parents, and then sometimes us other three kids and boyfriends and friends and always doing something. But we always go back to that core as a, as a family. And um, the other biggest, I think the biggest thing was that faith was a, a core main uh, binder for our family. And that was something that was led by both of my parents together. And, um, that was something that we always, that was, that's, that's at our core as a family and everything else stems from that. One of the, um, things that really drew me to wanting to talk with you is the, uh, if I just look at the columns that you've written, so you, you explained how you went from being a podcaster to an editor. How did you get to be a columnist at National Review? And how are you the only columnist that talks about, you know, every, every, every single column seems to come out, and it's like, wow, I like that too. Um, the children's literature, the art, uh, music, the, um, uh, I mean, here, there's one in here that I read, and I went, oh, my gosh. Were you, were you like in my family too? Because why we should still listen to Car Talk, maybe the most important thing you've ever written. How did that happen? <laughs> that is thanks to my boss, Charlie Cook. He was the, um, so he's still my boss. He's not the um, editor of National Review Online anymore. Um, but he, <laughs> right after I started editing for them back in August of 2018, I had some downtime and I was working on just kind of putting down some ideas on paper. Um, and I did not think of myself as a particularly interesting or even a very good writer. Um, and I definitely wasn't then. <laughs> I still have a lot of work to do now. <laughs> but um, I, I can't remember if I had said something to him or I think I just mentioned, oh, yes, I'm, well, I have some downtime now. I'm just kind of working on putting down some ideas. And he was like, oh, you can send it to me and I'll let you know if we would be interested in publishing it. And I was like, oh. Okay, <laughs> so that was the first piece I wrote for them was, um, gosh, it, it was a bit much to tackle for my first piece, but basically talking about emotion in teen, I, I'm a little bit anti-teen lit or young adult literature, I think there's a fine line there, and it was basically about uh, too much emotion um, and what that looked like in literature and how that was actually really damaging. Um, and so thanks to him, I would just occasionally, like every couple of months and be like, hey, I have this other idea. Um, they are generally, generally about literature because I'm not interested in politics. I don't really know a lot. I work around it all day and I find parts of it really fascinating. I think it's really important in some areas, but that's not where my interests and loves lie. And uh, so I become known as the children's lit aficionado at <laughs> National, Re National Review. Um, mm -hmm. That is what I love. But the car talk one, I I listened to car talk every Saturday when I was in New York, when I'd be walking different places and doing things. I mean, my, and my parents had listened to it while we were growing up. Mm. And so I pitched it one day and my boss laughed. He <laughs> thought it was the funniest thing. And uh, I actually, Doug Berman actually emailed me about that article. I was, I was really excited. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Yeah, so I, I uh, had, you know, every Saturday morning if I was out driving around, I would uh, subject my kids. They, they were forced to listen to car talk all those years. And, um, and now, I mean, one of them's even dead, and I still listen to it. So you're, what is your justification for listening to a, a dead guy talk about repairing uh, 1985 Toyotas? <laughs> uh, because it's, what's the word I'm looking for here? Important in, in some sense, but it's evergreen in a way. It, it's something, it's, it speaks to us, not just about cars, but about the human condition and, and the humor that is in, in everyday life and the camaraderie. I, I love the camaraderie between the brothers and, yeah, just the humor of it. It's we need to take that time to laugh and to to think about these problems in a different way. And uh, yeah, so yeah, maybe these cars aren't around anymore. Or everything's going to be computerized, but there is still some kind of deep human condition that can be enjoyed and understood by uh, listening to them talk. Well, I, I think it fills a really uh, important uh, niche for for what you're doing because. Um, it's like a, it's an oasis away from the, um, you know, the politics talk of the day, the social media quick takes and all that sort of thing. And uh, the, the thing that I really like about your writing is that I almost always know what you're writing about because when I, uh, my kids were growing up, we were reading the same books that you're writing about now. And it's just, it's just really delightful to me to, uh, to, to read that. I've actually commended your work to... Uh, my, my kids who, some of my kids are creative and, and want to write. And uh, just to, as an example of you can pursue your passion no matter where you are. Yeah, that's really true. It's really true. I've been very blessed to be able to do that. And, and I mean, I think it's quite amazing that you could pursue this kind of writing at a place like National Review. I, I think I, I commend the, the editors there for allowing you to do that. Very much so, yeah. So of all the things you've written about um, over the last two years, what's your what's your most uh, uh, favorite thing? Oh, gosh, I'd have to go back and kind of scroll through it. Probably the car talk one was was the was the highlight. I would think um, mm. I was really honored when NR asked me to write about write for the magazine about that. My first magazine piece was about my favorite author, Louise Malcott. So that was a big deal for me. I was really excited about that. Um, yeah, that was really cool. Um, just the opportunity, I don't know, in general, to be able to introduce these different authors and, and illustrators to people who may not have heard of them has been has been really cool for me. So, yeah, but probably the car talk one. So I, I think that you, um, you, you're no longer in New York. Um, I, think, I think there was an event that happened just about a year ago that kind of disrupted all of us. What, what happened with you? <laughs> so... Um, I, in December of 2019, I had already started to feel that New York was not where I was supposed to be living. Um, and I talked about it with my boss, I talked about it with my family, and then I was like, I just, I, I love my job, I want to keep doing it. I'm really struggling living in the city. Um, just uh, with some of the things I had mentioned earlier and just struggling with lack of community here and there, it, it was hard. Um, and so I talked to my boss and he was like, well, we'll think about it. And right before, I can't remember exactly when it was, but right before probably early March, late February, he said, yes, you can move back to Ohio. So I had a fellowship that I was finishing out um, and it, would be, it was going to be done in June of 2020. I was like, well, I'll stay through June of, of 2020 and wrap things up, say goodbye, pack up and leave. Well, <laughs> on March, March 13th of last year, I was supposed to go to a river dance concert in, in New York and Broadway shut down. And I called my mom and I had been working remote for a couple days just because people were starting to get a little weird about stuff. I called my mom and she was like, um, it'd be really nice if you came home. So I have never just showed up at the airport before and bought a plane ticket. And that is what I did. I packed a couple of suitcases and literally just it felt like I was fleeing the city, which I was. So that's how I left. And I still have not been back to New York yet. My roommate in New York, God bless her, she shipped my, all of my stuff back to me. Oh my. <laughs> well, we've all learned that we can do things from our uh, spare bedrooms. I guess that's a, a lesson from the last year. Truly. Um, so 
moms and dads, homeschool moms and dads that are listening today, and, and possibly some people who began homeschooling because of the COVID um, disruption, what would you say to them um, now that you are um, had a, a full career of being homeschooled and now you're well launched into a, a real live and interesting uh, career? What would you say to people who maybe um, are struggling with their homeschooling experience or maybe just starting and questioning whether they should continue? What's, what's your perspective? Hmm. Family culture is important. The, the way that you want your kids to, how do you want your kids to see the world and, and be aware of the things around them? How do you want them to engage with culture? Um, I think it's really important. I think homeschooling, as we've been talking about a little bit, plays a major factor in being able to create um, really healthy, strong individuals. Um, and you, you can create a really wonderful and beautiful environment for them. I felt like my parents were able to preserve a, a really wonderful or a, a great sense of innocence and wonder for us for a long time. That I think was really important. They didn't hide things from us or lie to us about things, but they were really careful with what we consumed and um, introduced things to us as we were able to as we were able to understand them and to handle them. And I think that that's something that's really important uh, for people to understand that by homeschooling, you have a really wonderful amount of control that you're able to exert. And um, yeah, and it's, it is really hard. I think that's something my mom would probably want me <laughs> to say <laughs> is that homeschooling, a lot of it, a lot of times, and, and shout out to all the homeschooling dads out there because I have known them and they do a wonderful job too, but, but primarily it is, is the mothers it's a really hard job. <laughs> and my mom is very tired. Homeschooling boys particularly is really hard <laughs> as I have, have heard. Um, so I think that that is okay to acknowledge the fact that this is really difficult and it is on top of parenting, which is itself a full-time job. This is, this is something really difficult, but I think we, it should be, it's important to remember that, um, it is really beautiful because you're forming souls. And so your parenting is, is forming souls, but also parents are the first teachers of their children. So what a more, this is an even better way to just continue that on and be able to fill them with a sense of wonder and, and delight in, in things. And just to remember that that's really important. Well, I, I really appreciate that answer, and, and I think what attracted me to wanting to do this interview from your writing is that your writing uh, expresses um, that wonder and delight through much of your growing up years and the literature that you, uh, that you write about and music and other things. I just have a couple of quick questions from people watching, watching here. Um, Shalita wants to know, did you focus on learning more about your career goals or more towards general education studies? Hmm. <laughs> I was actually talking with my mom about this uh, the other day, definitely more towards learning and, and um, enjoying the things that we are focusing on. Of course, some of them are really difficult like, for me, um, but ha you have to lay a foundation. And so there's some of that general learning in there. Um, so you have to know your basics, you have to know your grammar and your your math, like all those things, you have to lay those foundations and then you build on top of that. So, but through those processes, you are learning how to learn. So yeah, you you can have some, I, it's not bad to have an idea of what you would want to do eventually, but I think that was the beauty of our um, curriculum that we did, our liberal arts curriculum, and then eventually continuing that through Hillsdale is that you are learning the the higher things the the good and beautiful and true things because those are going to prepare you to take on anything in life it you just because you want to become a doctor doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a love of music or an enjoyment in music or you should you should know your history and you need to know how to do you should have be able to write well no matter what profession you could be a plumber we need good plumbers they should be able to write well and understand history and have a and, and read good books. So Agnes is asking, how do we choose curriculum? 
It's my first year of homeschooling, and I still struggle how to pick good books without buying all of them. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it's hard. So um, we used St. Thomas Aquinas Academy, um, which I would, always, I would highly recommend. I think they're wonderful. Books are really hard. Um, I have very strong opinions about this, is my guess. Um, but I'm trying to think. There are good resources out there for finding good literature. Please... I'm going to write about this someday. Please don't just let your kids run wild in the library. You should be in charge of the literature that they read. I, I may always makes me really sad when people are like, oh yeah, I, I would never, like my, my daughter or son would be mad if I told them what to read. Well, it's kind of the point. <laughs> like you should be filling their mind with good and, and beautiful things. So um, Lila Lawler over at like Mother Like Daughter, she has really good book resources out there and curriculum resources. Um, Mother Divine Grace, I think they've got really good book resources. I know there's some really good, um, I'm naming Catholic ones, but there's some really good Protestant ones out there. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but, um, yeah, there are excellent resources out there. Lila Lawler is, is good though for books. When did you start keeping records of your work and did you, um, get an official high school diploma before you went to college? I did indeed. Yes, I got a, an official high school diploma. I still have it somewhere in my records. <laughs> mm. But yes, that that was we everything was really official. We had to get we have transcript. We had to do grades and, and everything. What was the first part of that question again? Uh, when did you start keeping records, or when did your parents start keeping records? Oh, all the way through. So because we go, we went through St. Thomas Aquinas and, and still go through. Um, they have a lot of that stuff, but you. Um, High school is the most important. I think my mom has some records. This is a better question for her. My mom has good records, um, but it's particularly important as soon as you hit eighth grade and then into high school because you really need, you really need all of that stuff. Um, just have a big binder uh, for each kid if you've got multiple kids, and yeah. And I would just say that here at HSLDA, we have an awful lot of resources on our website at hslda.org. Uh, we have an entire division of uh, high school consulting. Um, people that can help you with those kinds of questions, record keeping, um, uh, preparing for college, college admissions, um, and, and it's a terrific job they do um, that uh, you can contact them. Um, we did um, a, a kind of a literature-based curriculum that kind of turned into a great books-based curriculum uh, when our kids made it into high school. and. I, I just I'm I'm just fascinated by I mean I I used to think of myself as being a, a reasonably well educated uh, adult person, and then I realized that I didn't really address the great books very much until I was in college, and then I read excerpts of them, mm -hmm. and my uh, middle school students are reading you know the entire Odyssey, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and they they know they know the Odyssey and the Iliad, and they know all I mean they know they they, they know things and and. It just it's it just seems so important to kind of you know when you when you uh, talk about farming you want to build good soil and always take care of the soil because what you know you need good soil for things to grow well and the uh, the approach to education that you've described and that my family followed um, was kind of aimed at that building good soil um, in a way that can uh, enrich the lives of our children into the future no matter what they choose because I mean ultimately they're going to choose. One of my kids is a UPS driver, you know, so, but, but he's read all that stuff growing up as well. Um, let's just see. No more questions that I see. Um, Sarah, is there anything that you would like to say for the good of the order or, um, you know, to answer questions that, good questions that I failed to ask? Oh, um, trying to think. I feel like you covered everything. Um, really well. Just, I would say, like, reiterate what I, I said at the beginning. Don't settle for mediocrity. It's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And then there's so much good and beautiful literature that you should read. So, yeah, and to just encourage that. 
Well, I, I have sh uh, certainly enjoyed not only just reading your, your work over the last couple of years, but also talking to you today. I really look, was looking forward to this conversation, and I think it's been a great encouragement to many people. We're going to make this into a podcast. Maybe we'll uh, contract out to you to help us make it into a podcast. Just, well, no, Ethan's saying no. He's shaking his head. <laughs> he, he's going to make it into a podcast. He's, totally our, he, cool he's, our, he's our podcast professional. Um, so if you'd like to read some of these articles that I've talked about, you can go to nationalreview.com and look for author Sarah Schutte. She um, has a whole host of articles up there now, and each one's better than the last one. So, you know, dig in, dive in, and um, just experience literature through the eyes of uh, Sarah Schutte as well. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about helping your child learn through learning disabilities, um, you can go to our website where we have a series called Does My Child Have a Special Need? Uh, we'll post the link uh, in the comments for you um, as well, and that's at hslda.org. That's where our website lives. Um, we've recently hosted two webinars as well. Uh, to help parents prepare their students for life after graduation. And we'll post those in the comments um, as well. And I just want to thank you again, Sarah, for, for uh, spending some time with us and wish you all the best in your um, exciting career. Um, thank you. Final, so word, final word to you. Oh, um, yeah, thank you so much, Jim. This was a, a, a really wonderful. It was great spending time talking with you. All right, thank you.